Well, I'm delighted to welcome everyone to this uh, terrific uh, event uh, in celebration of the Bicentennial uh, and, of course, the Ames uh, Final. Uh, we have a talk about oral argument in the Supreme Court. We've got a, a fabulous panel to discuss the issues. I'm going to introduce uh, everyone here on the panel. To my immediate right is Elizabeth Prodliger, uh, who is class of 2008 of the Harvard Law School. Uh, after graduating from Harvard Law School, she clerked uh, for Justice Kagan on the Supreme Court. Uh, she's currently in the Solicitor General's Office of the U.S. Department uh, of Justice. Uh, Elizabeth has argued five cases in front of the United States uh, Supreme Court. She's also argued in at least two federal courts of appeals and also in the New York uh, appellate courts as well. Um, Kathleen Sullivan, who may, may have recently seen at the Bicentennial, argue, re-arguing the Marbury versus Madison uh, case, is a 1981 graduate uh, of Harvard Law School. Uh, Kathleen has argued 11 cases in front of the United States uh, Supreme Court. She's argued in eight different federal courts of appeals, uh, also in four or five state, five different state <laughs> Supreme Courts, uh, for about 100 appellate arguments uh, overall. Uh, finally, uh, on the far right uh, is Larry Robbins, uh, class of 1978 uh, of Harvard Law School. Uh, Larry has argued 18 cases uh, in the United States Supreme Court. Uh, he's argued in every single federal court of appeals except one. Uh, the Seventh Circuit has yet uh, to receive Larry. He's argued 50 cases in the federal courts of appeals. Uh, and Larry has also done 50 trials, uh, 50 uh, jury trials uh, and non-jury trials uh, as well. Uh, Kathleen uh, is a named partner of the firm Quinn Emanuel, Uncourt, uh, and Sullivan. Uh, and Larry uh, is the named partner of the law firm Robbins, Russell, Unterreiter, and Englert. Uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, finally, rounding out uh, our panel <laughs> uh, uh, is the Chief Justice of the United States, John G. Roberts, Jr., uh, class of 1979 of Harvard Law School. And the great thing about chief, being Chief Justice is you don't need us anything else, right? <laughs> uh, need any, no more stats uh, are necessary uh, are there, but he's the 17th Chief Justice uh, of the United States. Uh, and actually, at this point, uh, by my calculation, he's the eighth uh, longest serving uh, Chief Justice uh, in the United States, um, and with years to go. Uh, so what we're going to do uh, <laughs> uh, is a series of questions to engage in the conversation with about oral argument, uh, principally uh, in the Supreme Court, um, often starting with the advocates and sometimes asking uh, the chief a question as well. So my first question is one uh, for the advocates, and I think I'd like to start out with uh, Kathleen, and that is when you were a law student here. Uh, did you ever think that this was something you'd be doing? Uh, like, was your aspiration when you started Harvard Law School as a, as a 1L? Uh, was it to do appellate advocacy, Supreme Court advocacy, or is this something which just sort of happened uh, more as a matter of happenstance and seizing opportunities? Well, the answer is yes. It's what I loved best at Harvard Law School. I loved it from my first year Ames Moot Court project. I loved being in the Ames Moot Court competition. We made it to the final round and won. And I thought, I'd love to do this, but had no idea that I could actually do it in real life. And I took a somewhat circuitous path to doing it. I said in law school to my friends, the one thing I'll never be is a law professor. And then I was a law professor for 28 years, uh, first for a decade here, and then for 17 more years at Stanford, where I was dean. And I managed during that time to get a few oral arguments, a few cases, mostly pro bono cases that I did and did oral advocacy in. Then when I finished being dean, uh, my partner, law partner, Bill Urquhart, said, why don't you come start an appellate practice at our firm? And so I got to do later in life exactly what I loved best at Harvard Law School, and I've loved every minute of it. How about you, Larry? No, I, I wanted to be Perry Mason. Uh, uh, probably most of you are too young to have any idea who that is. Uh, uh, he was a TV lawyer when I was growing up, and all the episodes were in black and white. He was a criminal defense lawyer who, unlike all criminal defense lawyers in real life, never actually lost a case. Uh, uh, um, I can assure you that you actually lose plenty. I, I thought I wanted to be a, a criminal defense lawyer. I thought I wanted to try cases. And that is actually mainly what I've done. I, I do a fair amount of appellate work as, as, as uh, 
Mr. La Professor Lazarus indicated. Yeah, be careful with that. Uh, <laughs> he struggled I, with that, I heard. What? He struggled, Professor Lazarus. I, I, well, it's, uh, we, we have known each other a very long time. Uh, um, uh, um, so I, I sort of, I, I ended up in the, in the appellate world really by happenstance. I, I, I became an assistant U.S. attorney as a Fed, which is a federal prosecutor. And in my office in New York, you tended to, um, if, you, if you tried a case um, and, and prevailed, uh, you would handle those cases on appeal. So I, I ended up learning the appellate craft through the uh, process of having first been the trial lawyer. And now I more or less split my time in both fields. <laughs> You know, when I first came to law school, I didn't want to be a lawyer at all. I thought that I wanted to be a journalist and wanted to write about the law, but then I got sucked in to appellate advocacy. Uh, I definitely early on, I think, uh, like many law students reading Supreme Court case after Supreme Court case after Supreme Court case, thought that appellate law was fascinating. But I think it was really uh, post-law school when I did my appellate clerkships and I got to see the mechanics of how you handle an, a case on appeal, how you write a brief, how you present a persuasive oral argument that it cemented my interest in, in pursuing that as my principal uh, practice area. And then going to the Solicitor General's office and having the opportunity as a relatively new lawyer to, to have the privilege and honor of arguing in the Supreme Court, uh, I think has fortified my, my thinking that this was the right career decision for me. Mr. Chief Justice, was this anything you were remotely contemplating? No. Uh, I went to law school because the career path I was interested in, becoming a history professor, was uh, a foolish uh, effort at that time. There was no opportunity really to do that. Um, so I thought law school was kind of like history. You would read old stuff and uh, uh, <laughs> tried to figure out what was going on. And uh, when I got here, it turns out I enjoyed it very much, but I actually hadn't I hadn't thought about a career path in the law and sort of didn't uh, contemplate any particular right. direction. So Larry, when you have a case before the court, uh, how do you prepare for oral argument the Supreme Court? Do you have a routine? Uh, do you have any rituals that you follow when you prepare? Um, no, I, well, I, I, I mean, I don't think there's anything unusual about it. Well, I have one. I had one ritual, which I'll describe in a minute. But you know, you, 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 you know, immerse yourself in the materials, and then what you try to do is imagine what your worst enemy would say if he or she were well informed about the case. What would what would some what what would your adversary uh, want to ask you if he or she were the judge? before whom you're appearing. And I try to imagine what the hardest questions are. Uh, unlike some people, I find it helpful to actually sit down and craft my answer. Uh, um, I do a lot of writing in the process of tearing, uh, 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 preparing for argument. Um, uh, I don't use the notes very much in the argument, but I, I try to imagine the hardest questions. I think this is probably what everybody does. Um, I don't know, rit ritual, I had one ritual, which I'll, I'll tell you about quickly. Uh, in the years when I was in the Solicitor General's office, which was overlapping with the chief and with Professor Lazarus, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, for, the, for the male lawyers, for the, for the men in the office, there was a ritual of wearing morning coats, which included a vest, and my ritual was that for oral argument, I would get my grandfather's pocket watch out of the vault and wear it with the vest. And it had a gold chain. And I would attach to the gold chain um, a charm that was uh, from that my wife, Leslie, who's here in the front row, um, she had uh, bought these charms in her grandmother's general store in the little town of Glen Lyon, Pennsylvania. And the charm was a little man in a bathtub. And I would, I would string it from the gold watch. And then I would step up to the lectern and pray that none of the members of the court could see <laughs> that I was wearing a little man in a bathtub for oral argument in the Supreme Court. That was my one ritual. So, Elizabeth, how do you, how do you prepare? 
So Larry said he does a lot of writing. I do a ton of talking. I talk out loud to myself in my office with the door shut so no one thinks I'm crazy. And I just process the case. I think about, like Larry, I think about all of the questions. And then I don't want to rehearse actual wording for answers, but I feel that talking out loud and trying to actually articulate the points helps me focus on which ones are going to be most persuasive and which ones I want to lead with. Because the, the fact is that if I've got three good points I want to make, usually I'm only going to have a chance to get one of them out in response to a question before the argument veers off course and I get asked something entirely different. So I find that kind of ritual of, um, of talking about the case to myself to be a really helpful focal point to try to, to try to prepare for the argument. And I don't have any charm rituals as well, um, but I do think that, that food rituals are very important. Uh, <laughs> I have the same dinner before every oral argument. I eat salmon, which is a superfood. It's good for your brain. Uh, <laughs> and then the morning of, I eat bananas. And I eat a lot of bananas, like two, three, sometimes four. Uh, so that I have, you know, it's the only thing I can stomach uh, with all the anxiety. But it gives me, hopefully, a good grounding for the argument. All right, Kathleen? Well, my rituals are really a combination of the ones you've just heard about. A, a, a oral argument is, is not a speech. It's not oratory. It's not uh, a debate with your adversary. It really has, it has only one purpose. It's about the judges. And it's about a conversation with the judges. And it's about a conversation with the judges in the order that they direct the conversation, not you. So the essence of preparation is to be prepared to improvise. I, I, I've often likened an oral argument to jazz. If you're a music aficionado, there's a lot of preparation that goes into that conversation between the instruments. But once it's happening, it has to be somewhat spontaneous. So my rituals are all about preparing questions and answers. Uh, yes, I have certain rituals. My, I do a script. It has to be in 14-point Arial. But the questions and answers have to be in 12 point times Roman. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chief Justice, century school book. Um, but the, uh, the point is I have rituals about how I prepare. But I think the most important thing I'd add to what's been said is just to do moot courts with colleagues, including colleagues who are not familiar with the case, so that you can try out your questions and answers. And then I go back and I rewrite the answers after each moot court, write, write the questions, write the answers, and try to make everything shorter and shorter and shorter. It's like reducing a sauce or boiling down maple syrup or turning something into a sonnet or a haiku instead of a novel. It's trying to figure out how to express your points as cleanly and clearly and succinctly as possible. Daily rituals on the day, uh, you know, write out your first sentence. It may be all you get out, but your first sentence has to be perfect and encapsulate your case. Repeat that a lot. And uh, of course, you must always have the same meal. You must always stay at the same hotel. You must always wear the same suit, the same pearls, until the suit wears out. Um, <laughs> dry cleaning is acceptable in between. But uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, there, there are rituals of repetition that are very reassuring. But the essence of it is to prepare to have a conversation with the judges. You're there to help them write the opinion. You're not there for yourself. You're there for them. And once you accept that, then everything else follows. And the meal? Ah, fish before and the night before and bananas in the morning, doesn't everybody? Superfoods. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Chief Justice, now, now you're on the other side of the lectern. How do you prepare for oral argument as the chief? Well, um, I, early on in the process, I sit down with my law clerks, all of them. One has principal responsibility for the case, but I all sit down and ask, have them ask me questions. Uh, and I ask them questions. Uh, so we have a dialogue, and I'm taking notes about questions they come up with. And I repeat that uh, you know, every four or five days, depending upon how much time I have uh, before that. Um, but that's pretty much it. I don't write out questions uh, in advance that take them with me. I mean, obviously, questions occur to you when you're preparing, reading the uh, briefs and all. But uh, mostly, it, it, it's the dialogue with the clerks. that they, And they come up with some great questions. Now, before you were uh, a judge, first on the DC Circuit, obviously now on the Supreme Court, you, you yourself were an appellate advocate, uh, arguing, I think, about 39 cases uh, before the US Supreme Court. Yeah, about 39. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that, that's Professor Lazarus. <laughs> what would you do differently, now that you've been a justice, uh, what would you do differently in, in preparing and arguing before court based on what you now know? 
Um, first of all, I would take seriously what everybody tells you uh, you should do differently, uh, which is uh, uh, in, in, in brief writing, keep things short. Because uh, 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 you can't imagine, every brief, you can be roughly about 50 pages. Every brief is 50 pages. And then all of a sudden, you get one that's 35 pages. And you turn it over. Who's that lawyer? You know, I like her, and it's just, <laughs> uh, uh, it changes everything. Uh, uh, but uh, and I would uh, one. I think I would. I, I like to think I try to do this. I would be a little more fair to the case. Um, it's 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 not. It's uncomfortable if you're a judge and the one side comes in and says this is absolutely clear. You know, only an idiot would think otherwise, and the other side says the same thing. Because you're thinking, well, I'm an idiot one way or the other. <laughs> but if you can be f fair to the case and, and not take an immediately extreme position, um, I always like it when uh, lawyers sort of give something up when they should. There was one time we had recently where somebody, one of my colleagues, asked about a case. And the lawyer says, I was hoping you wouldn't ask about that case, um, which is a very refreshing reply, other than that, uh, here's why that case that looks like it uh, isn't helpful, uh, actually is. Um, because it indicates that you understand the problem facing the judge, which is that if it's there at the Supreme Court, it is a hard case. And there are arguments on both sides. And it's the one way, maybe it's there are other ways, but one way to get the justices to be quiet is to say something like, that case is not very helpful. I think if you read the case that way, things are looking bad for us. Now let me tell you why you shouldn't. We will listen because you have sort of stuck yourself out there and said, this is something important, it doesn't help us. We're gonna give you a chance to say why you know, the case should not be followed or should be uh, distinguished. You go back in and say, oh, you know, that case really supports us. You know, the people are gonna still keep jumping in because that doesn't sound like you're being fair to the, I like to say fair to the case. Right. Uh, Kathleen, back, back to you. Um, when you're crafting an argument, uh, either writing the brief or presenting an oral argument, do you ahead of time anticipate votes uh, of justice? Do you decide sort of who are the who are the justices I'm likely to get? Who are the justices I'm not likely to get? Who are the justices I have to get? And, and do you craft your brief that way? Uh, and even more significantly, during arguments, um, do you does how you answer the question, how long you answer the question, depend upon who's asking the question, or or not at all? Yeah. Yes, in many cases, not in every case, but in cases where you know the predisposition of certain members of the court, you have to craft your brief that way. I'll give you an example. Some years ago, I represented wineries and consumers who were interested in shipping wine from wineries to consumers in other states across state lines. I've done so many cases, but winning this one is the only one that I often get thanked for <laughs> uh, because we were able to succeed. The, the, the question was, did the 21st Amendment uh, override the ordinary principles of the Dormant Commerce Clause, which would otherwise bar such facial discrimination in interstate commerce, because it allowed local option on, on, on liquor regulation. And I knew in advance that I likely had four votes against me, because uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor and Stevens had joined a prior decision in the aptly named <coughs> Bacchus Imports versus Diaz case that was in favor of state regulation. And I had a good hunch that the Justice Thomas appointed in the meantime would likely vote with that group because of his textualism and belief in states' rights. So I had to cobble together a majority that would consist of Justice Kennedy, joined by Justices Scalia, Ginsburg, Souter, and Breyer. And I turned to my co-counsel, Ken Starr, and I said, Ken, I don't think that lineup has ever occurred before. <laughs> and it turned out that was true. It hadn't. We won in that lineup. It never occurred afterwards either. <laughs> but the way we tried to plan is we knew that Justice Scalia likes bright line rules. He wouldn't like the facial discrimination aspect of this, even though he otherwise doesn't like the Dormant Commerce Clause. Justices uh, Souter and Breyer were likely to care about the pragmatics of interstate shipping. Could you still levy interstate taxes? Would there be any harm to minors? Or would minors be protected through other means? So we focused for them on the pragmatics of serving the state interest some other way. And then we thought with Justice Kennedy, we had to make a play to his views of federalism. He believes that federalism is a balance between the federal government and the states. And we had to convince him that this one was one about federal union and not, not, not states' rights. And so we did direct deliberate arguments to each of them. And it played out in the oral argument. Now, you can't always do it in that sort of precise a way. 
The danger in oral argument, to answer your second question, Richard, is what if you get stuck with the enemy, the ones who don't like your position, and there you have to try to find eye contact with somebody more friendly and try to get out of that corner. <laughs> right. So if, you, if someone who's unfriendly is asking you question after question after question, uh, when you finish answering their question, might you then not look at them? <laughs> well, eye contact is the key to oral argument, and you want to make sure you're paying attention to all the interlocutors on the bench, not just focusing on some. If you've had a sympathetic question from another judge or justice on your bench, you certainly want to try to quote them by name and get back to them as soon as you can and try to get them to come in and help you. Right. Mm -hmm. Larry, how about you when you think about briefing and arguing in front of the court? Are you thinking well, about different justices? Well, who well f first off, um, in most courts, um, other than the Supreme Court, you won't know um, until a week before the argument, and in some instances, till the morning of the argument, who your panel is. So the ability to, to um, sort of target your argument in that way, I think, is not, I mean, it's not practical, although in that last week, when you do get the names, you do try to pay attention to those differences. Um, I, I, you know, I, I can't really say that I've had cases where I've thought um, making particular arguments for particular justices uh, was uh, productive. Rufus? I definitely try to never write any justice off. Uh, I might be hopelessly optimistic, but I'm always hopeful that, um, that all of the votes are in play, which then makes it a more bitter pill to swallow if I lose 9-0. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I think that certainly I'm cognizant of what the justices' prior positions have been in cases related to um, the issues that I'm briefing, and I, and I think about that when I write the brief. I will say that in representing the government, I think unlike um, a different client, I, you also have to be really aware of government interests. And so I'm really always um, thinking about kind of what the government interests are, and that might hem me in a little bit in what I might say and, and what I can give up in trying to get a particular justice's vote, because it's it's not um, the the end game is not to win the particular case, but to make sure that nothing is threatening the government's interests in the mine run of cases in which it's a repeat player, and so that tends to be more of a, a force dictating how the brief gets written than trying to appeal to particular votes. Larry, uh, this is a, one question when I say everybody, and that is, do you think you have a distinctive style or yes. signature? In other words, if I, if I were to pick up a, a Robin's brief or read a uh, Robin's transcript, uh, uh, would I know without having your name? Would, I, would you hope that I would know that, and how would well, I spot I, it? Th th that I don't know. Um, but I, 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 f um, I, I feel as if I have a style that's, that, that you'd be able to tell. Um, but, and and let, me, let me get at it this way. When I came, uh, the first time I argued in the Supreme Court was December 1986. I had never previously seen the Supreme Court of the United States, much less argued in it. Um, and I had come from being a federal prosecutor and then, an, ar and then arguing cases in the Second Circuit where the bench that the judges sat on was high and distant. And you felt you were standing you know, at Mount Olympus and talking to the gods. <laughs> so it was a remarkable revelation when you stepped to the lectern in the Supreme Court, as I did for the first time when I was 34, and the justices are right in front of you at eye level not more than a few feet away. And it, 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 it lends itself, I think, and Kathleen used the word conversation. That's exactly the word I would use. It lends itself to the feeling of, inf oddly enough, of informality. Now, of course, you don't handle it informally. But if you think of it as a conversation where your job is to help the court and help the members and answer their question and not be wedded to the points you think are necessarily the most important. Um, but a conversation with several, with, with nine people who've thought about a case that you've been working on for a long time, um, I, think, I think that's the beginning of, of the right way uh, to do this. 
Yeah, but in terms of sort of rhetorical style or, or flair, well, do you think, I mean, you can, I can imagine being a government attorney, you sort of mute that a little no, bit. No, no, I, I never did. I speak colloquially, I write colloquially. Um, uh, there are tons of rules that I learned about legal writing here uh, 30 years ago, I violate on a daily basis. <laughs> and I urge you to as well. I, 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 I use shorter sentences. I use contractions. I have sentences that end with question marks, not exclamation points, by the way, <laughs> but question marks. Um, and I think I, I talk the way I write and vice versa. And I think that is, you know, so long as you're obviously respectful and well, deeply informed, um, I think you can tell, I think you can be funny. I, you know, there's no harm in not being, uh, you know, you, know uh, um, you, 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 can, you can tell a joke, but let the court, let the judge or justice get the punchline. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, so I, I guess I would, you know, my suggestion is once you get comfortable, um, there's nothing wrong with treating it exactly as you would a conversation. Um, look the justice in the eye. Uh, the ju you know, it's, it's a conversation. And treat the questioner the way you would with anyone else you're trying to persuade of a point. I actually remember one, this occurred to me, one argument you made. You began, I think, a fairly um, unusual way. You began with hypothetical. Yeah. So uh, this was... Uh, Professor Lazarus, <laughs> I have to remember that. Uh, uh, so I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, 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 professor, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good at this. Uh, uh, professor Lazarus was, was doing a moot court for, a very, for an argument. I was one of his moot court judges when we were in the SG's office. And that day, uh, a case had dropped off the court's calendar. It had, it had settled. And there was suddenly an extra hour that the court needed to fill, and um, it was going to. And the argument was going to be in like three days. And what the clerk's office did at the Supreme Court is they they basically called Larry Wallace, one of the deputy solicitors general, and said, "We're going to pick a government case because you're in front of us all the time. So we're going to make you guys. One of your lawyers are going to have to is going to have to come in." on like three days' notice, and it fell to me. I, I drew the short straw. Uh, so I had to, instead of having a month and three days for this particular argument, I had all of three days. And it, w it turned out to be completely liberating. Uh, the case was a case about the, f a rule of, the federal rule of evidence. And I thought that the case I was arguing did not illustrate as neatly the point I wanted the court to, 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 to make, uh, the ruling I wanted them to make. So I created a more extreme version of our case. And when I began the argument, I said, imagine a case in which, and then I proceeded to pro give a hypothetical. Um, before the argument, we, uh, the, the deputy SG and I sat down and tried to craft it as the shortest hypothetical we could Right, because we don't want to get interrupted, God forbid. So I had to get the whole thing out, and and they ended up. The court actually became engaged in the, by the hypothetical. They worked with it. They went back and forth, and late in the argument, Justice Stevens came back to it. So it, it ended up being a, a useful rhetorical right. device. Uh, Kathleen, do you think you have a, or try, do you try to have a distinctive style or, or not? I like to think I have one. I care about uh, making complex things simple and to try to be as vivid and energetic as I can in explaining them. I owe that skill, if it's a skill, to my 28 years of my other beloved work as a law teacher. I mean, to be a law professor was to try to take 
the complex and make it elegantly simple in dialogue with my students. And so it was, in a way, ironically, the perfect preparation for this. I do think most leading appellate advocates have signature styles. I believe I can pick up most of the leading practitioners. If you gave me a transcript cold, I could probably identify most of them and have signature styles and briefs as well. And you who are interested in appellate advocacy have an amazing resource today. You can read uh, transcripts and watch uh, videos in many circuits and many state courts and listen to audio, same-day audio of Supreme Court arguments. That's an amazing resource if you're interested in appellate advocacy. You can go on the OIA's website and replay arguments and stop it and watch the transcript. Uh, that, when, when I was at Harvard Law School, I used to have to creep into the stacks of Langdell, well, not creep, I mean, it was legitimate access. I did it during the day. <laughs> but I would go in, and, and, and the, the, there were five repository libraries of Supreme Court briefs were printed in hot type and bound into great big musty volumes. They were all by Archie Cox's office in the stacks, and you didn't want to disturb him. So you would tiptoe in and take down great big volumes and open them up as they crackled and run your fingers across the hot type and read the great briefs of the great Supreme Court advocates. There's Alan Morris and there's Rex Lee. You could read it. And you, all you have to do is sit in your room and click a few keystrokes and you can read those arguments today. And so if you want to be an appellate advocate, you have endless abundant resources both to read the briefs and to on, on websites like the SCOTUS blog where you, or the ABA website, you can read all this right now. And I think you can study signature styles, but then develop your own. Uh, Chief, um, after an argument, uh, uh, do the justices ever talk about the advocates, or do they just talk about the legal issues? No, they talk about the advocates. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, the very, the very first time uh, uh, that I presided and we came off the bench, it was a little disturbing uh, because they would talk about, oh, so and so, you know, wasn't on today, and can you believe that uh, this or that? And it sort of occurred to me that I had been on the other side <laughs> pretty uh, recently. Um, yes, we do. I mean, not every case, but um, uh, uh, you know, and. We appreciate good advocacy. Um, it makes a difference. We do as much as we can to hinder it, to be honest with you. We ask far too many questions, and I do my best <laughs> to try to uh, tone it down. Um, the only thing I would say uh, is that there is no one right way to do it. Um, uh, and you can practice to find out the way that you're most comfortable with. But there are some advocates who are uh, uh, a little more direct, a little more staccato. There are some who, you know, at least give the appearance they're thinking about it a little bit before and then, you know, have maybe a more elegant answer. And you kind of have to be comfortable. You can tell right away when someone's, you know, been coached to do it this way and that's not a way they're comfortable with. And the only thing I'd say um, uh, in response to uh, uh, Ms. Sullivan, not in response, but the cold uh, transcript doesn't tell you a, a lot. You do have to go and listen because it's all in the in the dynamics. It's all in the the spacing, uh, in 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 the tone. It's all in the appearance. I mean, you need to find a way to look comfortable there. I mean, because you know it's like you know dogs in the street. The justices can sense fear. <laughs> when they do, they're, they're ready to pounce. <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth, um, has anything happened at argument which has surprised you? Any surprising moments at argument? Uh, or any peculiar things happen? I was um, in the courtroom one day, not arguing myself, thankfully, when um, an individual stood up and started protesting in the middle of the argument, waiting between two different advocates who were about who were you know, trading off at the lectern, and. It was startling because the court is such a solemn place, um, a, a quiet place that it, but what really stood out about it to me was that the advocates who were arguing were not thrown off kilter at all. They stayed, they had perfect grace uh, in the light of that kind of surprising circumstance <coughs> and picked right up with the argument. And it really, I think, was a learning experience for me to see that no matter what's thrown at you, whether it's something from the bench or in the audience, uh, that, you can, that you can have that composure in the face of that. Larry? None, none that I can Nothing. think of, no. Kathleen? I have a dramatic memory of my very first argument. It was against a dazzling young deputy solicitor general 
named John Roberts. <laughs> and I had a constitutional argument that I feared I would lose on behalf of my taxpayer client. Um, I, I feared I would lose it, so I had an alternative statutory argument. I, I did turn out to lose the constitutional argument when I called Deputy Solicitor General Roberts to congratulate him on winning. He said, don't congratulate me. We should both congratulate Erwin Griswold, the former dean of Harvard Law School, who had written an amicus brief expressing the view that commanded five votes. Uh, the Chief Justice's position commanded four votes. My position commanded zero votes, which at least meant that I didn't lose sleep wondering what I could have done to change the outcome. But I did have an alternative argument, and the strange thing that happened is this. I said, uh, if you don't agree with my constitutional argument, you should hold that the special tax judges ruling had been, uh, it was really not the work of the tax court, and the tax court is given undelegable discretion, and it couldn't allow a special trial judge appointed by the tax court to exercise its discretion. And Justice Blackmun, who never rarely spoke from the bench, leaned over and said, are you saying that Chief Judge Sterrett rubber-stamped the special trial judge decision? Now, of course, I didn't want to cast any aspersions on Chief Judge Sterrett. I was just arguing that clearly erroneous review compelled deferential treatment of the special trial judge's ruling. So I said, no, Justice Blackman, I cast no aspersions on Chief Judge Sterrett. We're just arguing that the rule structure requires you to invalidate this as ultra virus. He leaned over and he said, are you saying that Chief Judge Sterrett rubber stamped the tr special <laughs> trial judge decision? At this point, I wondered, had I worn my suit to court that day? What is going on? I, I'm being set up here. And when he asked it the third time, he said, because if you think Chief Judge Sterrett rubber stamped the special tax judge decision, you can turn around and ask him. He's sitting right behind you. As Kathleen was speaking, I, I did think of one. In 1990, I, I argued a case for the government uh, uh, in which the question was whether um, uh, federal agents, um, DEA agents, needed a search warrant to conduct a search and seizure in Mexico uh, at the request of uh, local uh, police, uh, Mexican police. And I had been warned against a particular opening line, and I had trained myself not to do it, and then I did it anyway, which was, I began by saying, um, you know, the question presented in this case is whether the Fourth Amendment uh, requires uh, uh, the uh, uh, police officers or federal officials to get a warrant uh, when they conduct an overseas search and seizure. And the Chief, Just Chief Justice Rehnquist leans across the table and he goes, uh, I don't think that Mexico is exactly overseas. <laughs> And then, uh, and then, uh, you know, I tried, I recoiled and tried to regroup. And then Justice Scalia, who I think I'm now allowed to say since he's no longer alive, I used to play squash with him once a week. So we were on friendly terms. And he stepped forward and he said, uh, an overstatement in your very first line. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that kind of bailed me out, and I could go on from there. So the moral of the story is sometimes when something goes wrong and somewhere in the courtroom, um, you're the guy, you're the one. Um, <laughs> these, these are not very interesting stories. The, the, <laughs> <laughs> at least not compared to what happened when I was arguing. Uh, I was arguing against Larry Gould, who's a fabulous... Uh, lawyer did most of the big labor cases for the AFL-CIO. And the argument's going, and he's up there. And all of a sudden, Justice Ginsburg leans back and hands a note to one of the bailiffs or messengers. And this person takes it, looks at it, walks around, comes down to the well of the court, walks behind me and, Larry Gold, and hands the note to Larry Gold, who's arguing. <laughs> <laughs> so saying, what in the world is going on here? And he opens the note and looks at it. And I'm sitting there going, trying to see what it says. <laughs> I think I, I should at least know what it says or something. And, and then he just puts it down. And as far as I can tell, nothing else happens. And I cannot figure it out. And I go get a call from the clerk of the court you know, a half hour later after it's over. And he says, you're probably wondering you know, why Justice Ginsburg sent a note to your opponent during the argument. And I said, well, darn right I'm wondering. <laughs> And what happened is that she had written a note, said, 
get the petition, and the poor person behind her, it was her very first day, <laughs> looks at it and thought it says, give to petitioner. <laughs> so she figures, okay, and, and walks, <laughs> walks down and hands it to Larry. And I talked to Larry afterwards, and he said, well, yeah, you can imagine what I felt. And so it opens up, and it says, get the petition. <laughs> so he says, you may not have noticed, but I immediately went down to the stack of papers and put the petition, and you know, he thought that... Uh, <laughs> So that's a better story than the ones you <laughs> But And then he, he won nine to nothing. So I still think there was something more to the <laughs> okay, One of your jobs now is managing the bench uh, during the oral argument. It, uh, is that particularly challenging? And why and how, how do you t try to address that challenge? Well, it's, it's, it's very challenging. As these excellent advocates know, um, uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, and it's very hard because, uh, well, for example, if we have two issues in a case, I will try to tell people, why don't we focus on the first issue first, and at some point when I feel we've heard enough, I'll ask a question and we'll shift to the other issues. Sometimes that works. I try to encourage people to let people preserve time. In other words, the white light goes on with five minutes left. I think we should allow people to save time, so I try to encourage people not to ask questions. It doesn't always work. Um, uh, sometimes people, you know, some of the justices spend more time spinning out their questions than others. Um, and if they're, <coughs> excuse me, taking up a lot of air time, I try to direct the questioning elsewhere, which is not easy. I mean, I'll look over and I'll see that, you know, Justice Kagan has been trying to get a question in, you know, for the last 15 minutes and another justice has been going on. Then I will actually say, you know, Justice Kagan, you have, you know, a question. Or um, I try to look out for the lawyers. The justices, and it's, you know, it, I, I don't know if you can blame them for it or not, it's just the way it is. They will often ask questions uh, of, of uh, counsel, and one of the other justices will obviously respond in the form of a question. And you see that all, all the time. You know, uh, Justice O'Connor and Justice Scalia had a wonderful exchange that I vividly remember when, you know, Justice O'Connor asked the lawyer something about, well, I don't think there's, there may not be jurisdiction in this case. Uh, tell me about that. And Justice Scalia jumped in and said, well, isn't there a diversity jurisdiction here? And Justice O'Connor said, well, isn't the corporation you know, headquartered in Delaware? And isn't that? And Justice Scalia said, well, but their principal place of business. And the lawyer's <laughs> looking like this. It's like Wimbledon is looking back and forth. And then Justice O'Connor asked you know, one question, and the lawyer looks to Justice Scalia, and he, <laughs> and he leans over and says, you're on your own. <laughs> So I try to avoid that. I, I will say, you know, this might be, you know, if some justice is really, you know, badgering, I'll say this might be a good time to let counsel answer the questions or uh, uh, things like that. But you do have to be careful. I remember when I was a lawyer, Justice Stevens asked me a question. And before I could answer, uh, another justice, you know, asked me a, a different question. So the rule always is you ask, answer the last asked question. So I answered Justice, whoever's uh, question, and turned very a little theatrically to Justice Stevens and said, I didn't have an opportunity to answer your question. And Justice Stevens is beaming, oh, this is great. And I'm looking at him, and I realize I don't remember what his question <laughs> was. And so I just mumbled something about why we should win, and he looks very confused. So. <laughs> but, I, but I will say, we ask, we ask too many questions these days. We don't take as much benefit as we should from the extremely high quality bar uh, that, we, that we have. Um, and you know, I, I try to do my best to allow not only the lawyers, but also all of my colleagues to participate to the extent they want to. Elizabeth, you've been obviously in the SG's office the last several years. So um, uh, when Justice Lee was a major presence on the bench and, and obviously since his passing, what's your sense of how that's affected oral argument? Has it had a profound effect? I think it absolutely has affected oral argument. Um, and, you know, it, I, I miss him in cases where I know he'd be on my side because he was always one to speak up and, and through his questioning kind of signal how he was thinking about the case in ways that were helpful. And it's been a blessing in cases where he was against me because he would always ask those really difficult questions that were um, pointed and got right to the heart of the vulnerabilities of my case. But I think that, you know, as an advocate, I think we 
we really do miss him. He also brought a lot of levity to oral argument. Um, he frequently said things that were very funny and that could break up the moment. Um, I clerked for Justice Ginsburg, and I remember at some point during my clerkship, a study came out about um, who the funniest justices were, and Justice Scalia you know, had the top ranking, and Justice Ginsburg was unfortunately lowest ranked. She was really, really upset about this ranking, and she came to the clerks and said, you know, how can I be more funny? So <laughs> we tried to write her some jokes, it didn't really work, uh, but, but you know, I, I think that Certainly, the bench has changed, and I haven't had an opportunity yet to argue in front of Justice Gorsuch. Um, but you know, I think that that any time there's a new member of the court, uh, it changes the dynamic and has to factor into the advocates thinking about the case. Chief, what about uh, the impact on the on the bench and the court? Just a few thoughts. Well, I mean, um, you know, Justice Scalia is not somebody you can replace either uh, intellectually or in the dynamic uh, of, the, of the place. He was uh, uh, a big presence. Um, he filled the room, whether it was the uh, conference room or, or the uh, uh, chambers of the, uh, of, of the court. Um, and, you know, through the force of his intellect, the dynamism of his uh, uh, personality, um, we all miss him. I miss him. He was sat immediately on my, <coughs> on my left for the first part of my tenure and then on my right after that by seniority, and as funny he was in his statements to the court, uh, the notes and the sotto voce asides were hilarious. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but we've got, we've got a, a, uh, a, a wonderful panel of judges. They have their own particular styles of humor and not as uh, exuberant as, as Justice Scalia's, but uh, it, it remains a lively place. Larry, I'll ask you this question first. Um, have you ever had any cases you've argued, positions you've argued, where if you were a justice, you would have voted for the other side? So uh, uh, I'm going to fight the hypothetical okay. slightly. Um, I can't say that I've argued a case that I would have voted on the other side of, but I have argued a case to def defend the constitutionality of a statute I would never, ever have voted for. Uh, and let me, I'll tell you this story. Um, uh, in 1987, I argued a case called Ling against the United Auto Workers. I was in the government then. This is a statute that was passed in 1986, and it provided that if the reason your family lost money was because a member of your household was on strike, that loss of money would not count towards food stamp eligibility. And uh, so uh, even if you're, so in standard case, if the father of four or five children was out on strike because the steel workers or the mine workers were out on strike and he, he was the source of the family's uh, livelihood, uh, nobody, not the kids, not the parents, nobody would become eligible for food stamps. Uh, I personally would not have voted for that statute at knife point. But it fell to me to defend its constitutionality, and I had no doubt that it was constitutional, and I would have voted if I were a member of the court to sustain it, though I wouldn't have voted for it. But I'll just tell you the rest of the story. Uh, at this argument, I invited my grandmother uh, to the argument. Uh, she sat in the where the... Uh, visitors get to sit. She sat with, with my wife, Leslie, with my mother, and with our, our then uh, oldest son. She was a little hard of hearing, but she could sort of hear what was going on. And uh, I was explaining to the court why this statute was constitutional, because it, was, it, it, was, uh, it showed that the government would remain neutral in labor disputes. And Justice Marshall, uh, whose voice I had up till that point had never heard in the Supreme Court, took a copy of my brief and holding it, pushing it back and forth across his face said, so you're saying, Counselor, that in the name of labor neutrality, you have to take food out of the mouths of starving children. At which point, my grandmother turns to my mother and says, is, is that what he does for a living? <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I had to explain that I didn't pass the statute, but anyway, it was cold comfort for my grandmother. <laughs> uh, Kathleen, uh, if, you, if there any case you've argued you would have not been willing to argue the other side? Yes. All of my cases. Okay. <laughs> no, not, not quite true. I think the Chief Justice made a very important point when he said that you have to, uh, in especially in preparing for argument, give due to the other side and actually not treat your side as, as perfect and without flaws. So yeah, there, there are uh, plenty of cases in which I have thought that I uh, just literally could not have taken the other side's position. I was absolutely convinced of the correctness of my position, sometimes even in cases where I lost and I continued to believe that our position was the objectively correct position and the court had just missed it. Uh, but sometimes I could have leapt over to the other side and argued for them. Do you have any feelings on that? No, I think maybe it speaks to the power of cognitive dissonance, but no, I can't think of a time um, when I didn't ultimately persuade myself in the correctness of, of my position, even though, like Kathleen, I've sometimes um, been found that the court disagreed with me, much to my surprise and disappointment. Uh, but you know, I think that, that I've not always been able to persuade others. Um, in my last argument, in fact, where we had the opportunity to argue on the same side of a case, uh, I had just wrapped up the argument, and my father-in-law had flown to DC from Kansas City to watch me argue for the first time. And we walked out, and he didn't even say, you did a great job. He just said, you know, you're completely wrong, and proceeded to grill me all the way to lunch about, uh, about my position. And you know, we went back and forth. And I felt like I, the argument had continued, that I was still in the midst of it. And you know, finally, we got to lunch, and I said, I, the, the court has rested. <laughs> so and then luckily, um, our side prevailed. And so I, I really took great joy in forwarding the opinion to him. <laughs> If based on your experience as advocates, if you could change uh, any rule of the Supreme Court with related to advocacy, any rules you would change, amount of time uh, spent, any anything you change in how the court does things now? Well, I I think that the chief does a remarkable job of trying to manage uh, this brilliant court and with its many questions and to try to give the advocates a chance to speak. And in fact, it's it's quite wonderful when you get a few sentences out at the beginning and when he helps to direct traffic so that you get to respond to a justice who's been left out. So I appreciate the tremendous uh, the tremendous effort that he makes and it's, it's a magnificent court. It, it may well be the greatest court in the history of the United States in terms of preparation, intellect, focus. Having said all that, sometimes not every argument is, it needs to fit into an hour. Sometimes an argument is really finished before then, and sometimes an argument may benefit from a little more. So I suppose I would like it if sometimes we could go past 30 minutes aside, the way sometimes in the circuits you can go past your allotted time, if the questioning warrants it. That would be the only thing. I recognize that that would create a lot of discretion and, and potentially a sense of inequality among cases. But there have just been some times when I thought the questioning could have gone longer. Um, so that's maybe the only suggestion. Larry, do you have any views based on being an advocate on whether the argument should be televised? Yeah, I was going to say that's the one rule I would at least consider. Um, I don't know that I would do it routinely, and I do understand and respect the, the, the view that it changes the dynamic in ways that are not productive. But I, I think that... I don't think there's much about the, the way democracy functions that is better than the way lawyers and judges, and especially lawyers and justices, interact. And I think there is an extraordinary teachable moment, as they say, that would cast democracy in a very much kinder light and, and, and it would educate the public. And if I can be forgiven a moment of partisanship, there is no greater time than now for the, for the public to appreciate what democracy is capable of. So I would, I would consider whether certain cases should be televised. We have a lot of law students here. Some of them may be thinking at some point having a career in appellate Supreme Court advocacy. What, what advice, Elizabeth, would you give them in terms of 
you know, classes to take when you're in school or and beyond that, when they graduate, should they think about immediately becoming uh, a appellate specialist or should they try to be uh, a general litigator first? Any thoughts? Well, I would say definitely take Fed courts. It has uh, come in handy so many times in my practice. I frequently am in the position of writing a brief in opposition to cert um, at the cert stage. And I feel like it's one big uh, Fed courts issue spotting exam to come up with vehicle problems to convince the court that it does not want to review that case. Uh, so that's been a really useful law school class that has stayed with me. You know, in terms of, of steps to take, I have to put in a plug for government service. Obviously, the SG's office is a fantastic place, but the Department of Justice generally, um, the divisions, are incredible opportunities for relatively new lawyers to get really uh, early responsibility over appeals and to have a chance to, to get into court and to argue in court. And I think there's no better place to get that kind of experience, and which you can then use uh, if you ultimately want to go to private practice or to, or to do something else in appellate law. Actually having that in-court experience that you can get in the government really can provide a, a launch pad to those other opportunities. Kathleen, any, any thoughts? Well, I echo the thought that government jobs, not just in the federal government, but also in city corporation councils offices or state solicitor general's offices can be wonderful places to get uh, appellate experience early in your career. But there are rich opportunities in the private sector as well. There are wonderful appellate practices at a number of firms. Many are focused on DC, but some are, as my firm's is, are focused in other jurisdictions. We practice principally out of New York and California, for example, and we're close to industries that have a lot of appellate work that we can be close to. So don't overlook opportunities in the private sector. I would just add, I think it's a mistake to silo yourself as a purely appellate lawyer because uh, to be a great appellate lawyer, you also uh, have to have, understand where the record came from and what the trial lawyers did to get it there and, and to be part of trials, to be part of, if you're on the plaintiff side, fashioning complaints, to be part of motion practice, to have helped craft the instructions in a jury trial is an important part of being a great appellate lawyer, to know how the record goes. To be a great appellate lawyer, you have to know the law, but you have to sometimes know the record better. So I think to focus on facts and have some experience on the trial side as well is a very valuable skill. So you can be a great appellate lawyer as your principal focus, but try to get trial experience too. Chief, I'll let you answer the last question uh, of the day. Uh, what if their aspirations are even greater still? Um, what if they want your job? Uh, <laughs> what if they want to be Chief Justice? This is after, though, you've done it for decades more. Well, um, obviously it's like it's being struck by lightning twice uh, and you can't plan on being uh, the Chief Justice. If you do plan to be the Chief Justice, you're probably not the type of person they want uh, uh, for, for the job. Um, but I will say if I can, uh, uh, you know, what you should do if you want this type of work. All of the suggestions are good, but the part that makes this fun for all of us is obviously standing up uh, and arguing. You, the written briefs are more important than the arguments, but it's the arguments that are fun and sort of keep us coming back. And I'll give the advice that uh, a fellow named Barrett Prettyman, who was uh, in, in my, uh, the law firm I joined and my mentor uh, in, in some of this. And at the beginning, because you're all gonna be there at the beginning, you just have to promise to yourself, and he made me promise to him, every single opportunity you got to stand up and talk, that you would stand up and talk. You would not turn down any invitation, and he would send as many as he could my way. And I will never forget talking to the, I think it was the Maryland Conference of Bankruptcy Appellate Lawyers. <laughs> it was a room as big as this, even bigger, and there were five people there. Two of them were sitting there, one way back there, the guy reading the newspaper was there, and you stood up and you gave whatever it is they asked you to, to talk. So it will make you more comfortable doing it, uh, and, and it will develop a lot of skills that you're going to need. But, you know, it's, it's in the area of paying your dues. And when, wherever you go, whether it's at the government or at a law firm, you know, nag people about opportunities to do that. Uh, big law firms, most of them are doing pro bono work and they will have appeals that may be terribly mundane, but it'll be yours and you can get up and, and do it. Uh, and uh, the government, uh, state and federal and local also have the same things. And whatever it is, just, just do it. And, You'll get better at it, and as you get better at it, people will notice, and people will hire you to do, do their stuff. Well, I want to thank the panel, and have everyone join me in thanking them for today. <laughs>